And it is good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? I have a few announcements that I would like to share with you. And um, I think we have an announcement from the youth leader as well. Um, as he gets ready to come up and make that announcement, I just would like to make a special request for the treasury team. The treasury team and the stewardship, stewardship leader just to meet with me for uh, less than five minutes after church. Kindly meet with me after church for less than five minutes. Treasury team and the stewardship leader. Renier, are you here? All right. Good morning, everyone. Just a reminder for all the teens that I hope you brought all your stuff as we announced a couple of times that we are leaving straight after church. So if we all can meet here behind the church, there's this opal grass bank where they cut the trees, this open part. We can all meet here on the side. Then you will see Nick's car, my car with the trailers. We are ready to put some of you in the trailer and the luggage inside the car so that we can leave as soon as possible because I know you guys are going to be hungry. You can start complaining halfway to how we come hungry, I want to eat. So we want to leave as quickly as possible. So we pray for the service. <clears throat> We pray for the service that all will go well. Okay, so just, just a reminder, the back side area of the church, straight off the church, go and fetch your luggage, go straight there. We're going to meet you there. We're going to pack and we're going to leave. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Renier. Church, please pray for uh, the, our team, uh, young people that will be going for uh, overnight. Um, they are excited. Uh, the Horn family is excited to have them. Um, there's going to be about 18 of our young people that will be overnighting there in Howick. May we keep them in our prayers and may it be a wonderful weekend for them. We are in our 10 days of prayer and it is going well so far, isn't it? I want to encourage those of you who have not been able to join us here at church, we will be here again on Monday evening. Monday evening at 6.30 p.m. We're here for about an hour. It's Monday evening, Wednesday evening, and Friday evening, and then we culminate, we climax next Sabbath. So please join us. If you are not able to make it here, please do so at home. Today is day four. And we will continue tomorrow, day five. Monday evening here will be day six. Keep your eye on the announcement group. That is where we post uh, the daily readings and prayer guides. Our uh, call to worship for this morning is from Psalm 27, verse 14. It says, wait, wait, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Shall we pray? Holy Father, as we wait upon you to speak to us, open our hearts, prepare us. I pray that you will send the Holy Spirit to touch every heart and just make us fertile soil this morning to receive your word in Jesus' name. Amen.
privilege, what a promise, what a challenge that you want us to be your vessels, emptied of self, filled with your spirit, to proclaim the glory of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you have spared our lives to see another year. Now as we in your presence, please fill us with your spirit. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stay standing as we open in the song. For our, our prayer time, we're going to do it a little bit different. It is 10 days of prayer, and God's people must be immersed in prayer. So instead of me praying alone here this morning, I'm going to invite you to kneel where you are and pray with the person next to you. 1 Peter 5, verse 7, he says, God says through Peter, cast all your cares. And that word in cares is, is such a rich word, such a loaded word. It is deposit all your concerns, your worries, your stresses, your anxieties, your requests. Your requests, cast, deposit, all of that, deposit it, put it, offload it onto me, Jesus, because I care for you. A God that is intensely interested in his children offloading whatever is on their hearts and on their minds. And so this morning, we want to bring our requests before the Lord in prayer. If you have a spouse that you want to pray for, this is the time. If you have a child that you want to pray for, this is the time. If you need a job, if you need financial help, this is the time. This is not a time for us to hold back and feel ashamed. Where else are you going to take it? Where else are you going to take it? He said, cast your cares upon me.
because I care for you. So whatever is on the heart this morning, take it and deposit that onto the Lord and trust Him to work it out for you. Right now, let us kneel and let us pray, whether it's two or whether it's three together. Let's take our time and enjoy this moment of prayer. If you don't mind, at a certain point, I'm going to start praying. And I'm sorry if you're going to be halfway in a prayer, but obviously we sit with a church that is fully packed. There is no way that we'll be able to manage that, anything different. So I will just at a certain point, I will pray, the Lord knows your heart. And um, let us raise our petitions to the throne. Amen.
Shall we pray? Holy Father, what a privilege it is to be in your house of worship this morning. We thank you, Lord, that all these prayers could ascend to the throne room of heaven. What joy it must bring to the heart of God to see his children trusting their God with their cares and their concerns and their requests. We know that you are a prayer answering God. We know that you care for each one of us and that you only want the best for us. And Lord, all these prayers that ascended, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will answer those prayers according to your divine and sovereign will. And now, Lord, as we prepare to hear your word, speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we invite our deacons and deaconesses to serve the church as we return our tithes and offering. Where he shared a room with a close friend, both sharing unwavering love for the cause of truth. However, while Luther decided to wage war on behalf of the Reformation, his friend remained in the monastery praying and interceding for him. One night, Luther's friend had a dream. He saw a vast field stretching to the horizon, ripe for harvest. He also saw a solitary figure attempting to collect all the crops, an impossible task. Soon, he was able to see the face of the lone worker. It was Martin Luther himself. This dream taught him a great truth. He'd better stop praying for his friend and start working with him. Getting started is what differentiates action from intention. Many people make decisions at the end of each year. Some decide to initiate a regular physical activity program. Others resolve to save money or to shed unwanted pounds. Yet no resolution is as important as the ones related to our spiritual life. Therefore, it is crucial to start the year by renewing or establishing principles of faithfulness and commitment to God. God beseeches us by his mercies that we present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to him, which will become our rational worship. The following resolution should be at the top of our list. One, set aside daily at the beginning of each day, time for personal communion through the reading of the Bible, the Sabbath school lesson and prayer. Two, Gather your family daily, at the beginning and at the end of the day, for short moments of family worship. Three, reaffirm your commitment to observe the Sabbath from sunset to sunset. Four, make it a priority to worship God in person while attending church services. Never allow virtual options to replace your attendance whenever you can go. Five, Renew your commitment to faithfulness by returning tithes and offerings regularly, as regularly as God provides you with an income or increase. According to the Bible, the tithe should be 10% of your income. For the offering, you must set a percentage for offerings that will be given proportionately to all income received. As you start this journey, moving from intention to action, God will assist and strengthen you Remember that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. As we return our tithe and promise offerings, may we put our desires last and God first. Amen to that. Shall we pray? Holy Father, what has been returned to you, may you accept it, Lord, as our love gifts to you. I pray that you will bless it, use it for your purpose and your glory. Amen. Amen. At this time, we invite the children to come and take up the little lamb's offering and then to sit down for a story.
Well, good morning, boys and girls. How are you today? Okay, one person is good. What about the rest of you? Okay, excellent, excellent. Isn't it a great day? What a beautiful sunny Sabbath we have after rain and rain and rain and rain and rain. All right, so we are so glad that you could come up. I've got a story I want to share with you, but before we do that, who's going to pray for us? Maybe we can have a mic there, please, Pastor Isaac. Okay, Rachel is going to pray. Red mic. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you as we could be at Sabbath. And thank you as we could be at Story now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Rachel. Now, who likes a good rescue story? Right? Yeah, it's always exciting, especially when a story ends well. Well, let me tell you about what happened many years ago, true story, in a country called El Salvador. There was a great earthquake, and the earth trembled and shook. The children were frightened and tried to hide wherever they could, but this was a terrible earthquake. The city was destroyed, and over 3,000 people died sadly that day. But there was one really good story that stood out amongst all the tragedy, the pain, the sorrow, and the suffering because a rescue mission was put together to see if they could find some survivors. And so they searched and they searched and they searched through all the rubble. And four days had gone by and they wondered, will we find anybody alive? And just as about the rescue mission was to be called off and that all hope had been given up that anyone could be saved, suddenly as some rescuers moved through the rubble, they saw a hand sticking out amongst the rubble. It was incredible. How is it possible that somebody could survive four days under such terrible conditions, trapped under all that rubble, no food, no water, just a short space to breathe and a tiny little place to put his hand out. He had heard the people moving around and he heard the voices and he just put his hand up. It was a middle-aged man and frantically the rescuers began to take the rubble off one by one and finally they were able to pull him out. He was injured but he was alive. And so they had to take him to hospital. This story hit the headlines in El Salvador and different parts of the world. And so a news reporter went to the hospital to visit this man. And they asked this man a question. How is it possible that you survived during those four days? Do you want to know what his answer was? He said, I did not give up hope. I waited and knew rescue was on its way. And so whenever disasters happen and you see teams of rescuers going there, always remember, while there's life, there's hope. This man had life in him and he did not give up. And so the Bible says here in the book of Titus 2 verse 13, looking for that what? that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Isn't that something that we can look forward to? That this world is not going to end in a terrible war and everybody will be destroyed, but that even though we face trouble and difficult times, even though it may look like everything has been lost, Yet God is in on his throne and Jesus is coming soon to rescue all those of us who hope in him and trust in him. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much that Jesus is coming soon and that he has said, except we be like little children, we cannot be saved in the kingdom of God. Help us that our faith may grow every day whilst we wait on the coming of the Lord. Soon and very soon he will come and not tarry. May each one of us here 
all the children with their dads, their moms, their brothers and sisters, and their family and friends, be prepared for the coming of the Lord. We ask in His name. Amen. so good to be with you here in Pine Town Church this morning. Uh, I really must tell you, we had a good time in Cape Town. This was the view from my window. What a view it was. Sunny clouds, beautiful fresh air in Stellenbosch. Um, is Alice here? Okay, Alice is not here. But... Um, I was just so inspired by looking at this every morning. Getting up, sometimes the clouds were low, sometimes they were high. But there was sun every day, Zandri. And then one day, just one day, it was a Sabbath afternoon actually, it rained. But soon after it rained, the sun came out again. And this was the view from my window. Uh, we had a beautiful time with... Uh, our friends, visiting family there. Lynn was not wanting to come back. So they stayed an extra week. She convinced Corey somehow. Corey found no problem because he heard it was just raining here in KZN. So he said, Dad, I'm staying another week. I said, enjoy, enjoy. But um, we had spent a, a Sabbath afternoon with Bruce and Priscilla. And later on during the week, we went to a place called Postcard Cafe. Now, I'll show you a picture of Postcard Cafe another day, and you'll understand why it is called that. It was absolutely glorious and beautiful. It was like a little garden of Eden. So we had to come back eventually to Durban. We left when it was raining, and we got back. It was raining. <laughs> Beverly had to take off all the sofas outside and put them to dry out. There was some sun the next day. There was mold. We had to invest in a dehumidifier because every was just mold in the house. So um, that's the weather here. But we praise God for the rain, right? But this morning, I'm glad to be with you. Um, God was good to us. We traveled many, many kilometers, first to Cape Town, almost 1,700 Ks, came back here, and then drove the same distance to Zimbabwe and got back late Thursday evening. So we are so really, really grateful for God's mercies. So this morning I thought I'd speak to you on the subject, waiting on the Lord. But right now let's ask him to bless us in the study of his word. Father, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity to know that you're a God who never slumbers nor sleeps. A God who is on time always. A God who always is seeking to save us, to bless us, to help us to guide us, to empower us, and to prepare us for your soon return. Please speak to our hearts now as we ponder this subject, waiting on the Lord. On our way back from Zimbabwe, we left at 3 o'clock in the morning, crossed the border in good time. I was praying and said, Lord, please help us, because when we were going, it took six hours to cross the border, Renir. Five of that was on the South African side. Documentation and all sorts of things. And I was getting rather impatient that time is ticking. I had worked out that we would get into Harare before sunset, before the Sabbath. We had got to the border 8 o'clock in the morning. So I said, well, two hours to cross, 10 o'clock we've crossed. It's going to take about six hours. So we should be in, an, in Harare around about 3 o'clock. Time to just settle down, visit the family, prepare for Sabbath. Well, we actually left the border at 3 o'clock and got to Harare at 10 p.m., rather, rather tired. And so sometimes, you know, we're waiting and we're so anxious. Sometimes we get upset coming back. We crossed only in an hour. 
And um, there were no queues on the Zimbabwean side. And there was a lady and a husband in front of us. And just as we were about to pay the toll to cross the bridge, they changed shift. And you know what happens when you change shift? <laughs> You've got to sign out the computer. And then the next person taking over your shift has got to sign in because everything is computerized. Every single process. But the problem was, the lady who was serving us, she's signing out, but there's no one to replace her. And the lady and her husband, they were middle-aged. She got really upset and started telling the lady behind the counter a piece of her mind. Don't you know that we pay you to be here? What is wrong with you? How can you sign out before your replacement is here? And the lady saying, ma'am, I, 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 it's a change of the shift. But she was irritable and she began to tell her how irresponsible she was and how terrible this place was. And I was just behind listening to all this and I was just praying, Lord, give me patience. I also wanted to go. And I didn't want to wait any longer as she didn't want. But we, we struggle as human beings with this idea of waiting. We're so used to fast food we're so used to getting things online. And so if they're not delivered on time, we get upset. And we send letters of remonstration to whoever is delivering the parcel. And sometimes we phone their office and say, what a useless bunch of people they are. I've heard people do that. And I just pray that, you know, we might, during these 10 days of prayer, be so immersed with the Holy Spirit that we will become patient. You know, patience is the, one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, right? And so John sees the end time church, God's people at the end of time, after the angels have sounded, the end of the third angel's message comes the clarion call. God announcing to the world that over here is the patience of the saints. Those who what? Keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And so patience comes from the Lord. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 25 says this. The Lord is good to those who what? Wait for him to the soul who seeks him. Sometimes we, you know, we want God to come through for us right now. We cannot wait. And so many times our prayers are, Lord, you've got to do it now and many times we want God to do it in His way. But the Spirit of Prophecy says, God's promises no, no haste, no delay. In His time and in His way, He knows what is best for us. In verse 26, it goes on to say here that it is good that one should wait quietly for salvation of the Lord. And whilst we are watching and waiting, we are also looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I am tired of the sin-sick world. Every time you lose a loved one, you just think, who next? When will my day come? Every time one of your loved ones or you get sick, you wonder, will I pull through, especially when it is a terminal illness? The Bible tells us to look up. Don't look below. It says here, for our citizenship is where? In heaven. From which we also what? Eagerly, what's that word? Wait. Wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus is our great example. And he came to this earth to reveal the love of the Father. And uh, I read this statement here while I was uh, on holiday. And I pondered much on this statement. It says, the Savior's life on earth was a life of what, everyone? Communion with who? With nature and with God. In this communion, He revealed for us the secret of life, of a life of power. I pondered on this statement. Do I commune enough with God? Do I spend time in nature and just be still and listen to the voice of the Lord. Sometimes it comes through a bird. 
You know, that happened to me one time many, many years ago before I came here, moved from Zimbabwe. I was in my study and um, been going through a really tough time business-wise and also I was just feeling really down in terms of my walk with the Lord. And um, I spent some heartfelt time with the Lord in prayer. I got up off my knees and I sat on my desk. And you know what God did for me? Irene sent a little sparrow, beautiful little bird. It came right up to my window. I mean, I could almost touch it if there was no glass. And it just looked straight into my eyes, Wonga, and started singing a beautiful song. It was a hummingbird. I just paused and I stopped and I admired the beauty of this little bird with all its iridescent, radiant colors. And I just knew this was God speaking to my soul. Listen, if I can take care of these little sparrows and there are billions of them all over the world, I can take care of you. My day changed completely with that one encounter. It was early in the morning. Notice what it says in the book, Gospel Workers. I read this also while I was pondering, preparing what I'm going to speak. The statement grabbed me. It says, God jealously your hours for prayer, Bible study, and then this one, and self-examination. Chris, that really struck my heart. Now there are times when I do examine myself, but it's not something that I guard jealously. Sometimes it's flippant, sometimes it's fickle, sometimes it's carefree, but there are days when God wants you and I to pour out our heart in self-examination. Set aside a portion of each day for a study of the scriptures and communion with God. Thus you will obtain spiritual strength and will grow in favor with God. In a world that is so rushed and busy with people clamoring to get the first place in life. In a world where social media takes most of our time. In a world where we hardly spend time with the family. Few families, I believe, even sit around the table and eat together. Um, there's a picture I took. I don't have it here with me. I was in um, the VNA with my family. And I looked at, we were at uh, Willoughby's restaurant. Some of the best sushi you can ever buy is there at Willoughby's. I looked at the family across. There's a father, mother, son, and a daughter. Do you know what they were doing? Each one of them was on their cell phones. And of course, they were anxiously waiting for the meal. If it doesn't come on time, then they're upset with the waiter or the waitress. So we live in a world that is so rushed. A world where... The temporal and transient things of this life seem to take precedence over communion and time with God, with his family, ministry, and especially self-examination. I watched as at midnight the different countries celebrated New Year's Day. Uh, I think probably the one in Dubai, they just spend billions on blowing up crackers and lots of fireworks. But the one that uh, was kind of like very artistic was probably the one that was in London because they showed hearts in the sky and they had like messages, there was nice soothing music and songs that went with it. And I just thought, wow, people are celebrating the New Year's and many of them in drunken revelry. Many of them just excited to party and be out for the night. Many of them just thinking of what is it for me that I can do and what can I enjoy? Many of them self-absorbed. Many of them tired and not knowing where to turn to. And God all the time is saying, listen, wait upon me. Wait upon me. As we go through this 10 days of prayer, I'm reminded what happened to the disciples in that upper room. Apparently, that upper room is still there in Jerusalem. It's been authenticated that this is the place. I had an opportunity to go there with uh, Dr. Francois and the team. And I just went to a little corner and I just asked the Lord, you came 2,000 years ago. You're still the same God that can come into my heart. Please come into my heart. But I want you to notice what 
the spirit of prophecy says what the disciples did besides praying during the 10 days in the upper room. Notice what it says here in the book Evangelism, page 698, paragraph 2. After 10 days of what, everyone? Heart searching and self examination, the way was prepared for the Holy Spirit to enter the cleansed and soul temples. Every heart was filled with the Spirit. Why? They took time to reflect upon their lives. And that's what I want you to, to look at this morning uh, very quickly as we examine three incidences in the first, in the Old Testament and then in the New Testament. The first one I want to look at is Abram. Abram was told by God, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you and I will make you what? A great nation from your family and from your father's house. Um, and I will make you, sorry, a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Did Abram obey? He did. Now the Bible says he was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. 75 years old. Um, there's some of us here that are 75 and above. I'd like to ask you the question, um, Sister Esther, imagine... God says to you and your husband, David, pack up everything and move to a place I'm going to tell you. Now, it's one thing if God says, this is where you're going to go, and this is what's going to happen before you go, and this is what I'm going to do along the way. Is that what God said to Abram? He said, leave your comfort zone and go to a place that I am going to show you. He didn't even know where he was going. He had to trust in the omnipotent power and providence of the Lord. But he obeyed the Lord. He packed up his family and they left. Now God had told him that he would be the father of many nations. Now we know the story, right? Sarah was barren. But God had told him the promise. Now when did the promise come to pass? 25 years later. Could they wait on the Lord? You remember what Sarah said, listen, Abraham, you need to do something here. Here's my maid. We will have the promised child through Hagar. Today, right now in Palestine, we're living with the aftermath of that terrible decision. Yes, Ishmael was born. And through him, there has been, through his descendants, this constant war and trouble between the seed of Isaac and the seed of Ishmael. And so that didn't work. But God's timing is always on time because it says here, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. And even though he had failed to wait upon the Lord at that point in time, and he and Sarah had made a tragic mistake in trying to work things out on their own instead of waiting upon the Lord, but God still comes through. We serve a merciful and patient God, a forgiving God. It says here in verse 19, Then God said, Sarah your wife shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. This time next year, he was 99 years old when that promise was reaffirmed. This time next year, she will give birth. And so when he was 100 years old, the promise was fulfilled 25 years later. Sometimes God takes 25 years to come through for you. Sometimes your prayer will be answered in the resurrection. Sometimes he comes through right now, Chrissy. He is a God, a miracle working God. I met a pastor, Pastor Nyahuma, when I was in Harare this past week. I was doing a stewardship seminar in Ambilo Church, middle of last year, towards the end of last year. And I met a doctor, young doctor, Dr. Osmond, and he came up to me afterwards and he wanted to chat with me. Anyhow, our story went like this year. I'll give you the very short version. There's a group of people on the very western part of the border, close to Zambia. 
They call the Lumba people. This group of people live in fear of wild animals. Their houses are built on stilts, Armand. And they have no food. They're nomadic. They roam from place to place hunting animals for sustenance. And so this group of people here, God had placed upon the heart of this man to reach out to them. And so he said to me, is there anything we can do for the Lomba people? I said, the next time I'm in Zimbabwe, I'll see what I can do. And so when I was there, I went to connect myself with some people that could be of assistance. Their main need there is food, clothing, blankets. Those are the three most urgent needs. Uh, I didn't realize God had already done a, a great work because I spoke to someone who I knew and I said to him, listen, I need to network with some people and see what we can do for these people that are really living out there on the uttermost side of the border. And he said, I know just the man and he's in town. He's come in from Germany. He called him right there Sabbath afternoon and Tuesday morning I was sitting with him in his office. Dr. Domba said, Yaumba, sorry, said, listen, I was the one that did the pioneer work for those people. Today we have a clinic, we have a school, we have three one-day churches. I said, how many people are there here? There's about like just around a thousand people. He's written, he's a professor by the way, he's written an article for the government of Zimbabwe to highlight the plight of these people. Illiteracy is very high. They are poor, they don't have a home, they know medic, and they climb trees as fast as a monkey or a baboon can. It's true. And instead of five toes, they've got three. It helps them climb even much quicker. There's all sorts of stories about how they came to be like that. But here's the thing. He told me this, he says, when I was there, he stayed there for six years. Pastor Isaac, the conference president, sent him to this remote part of the country because he had come up against him in a committee and thought, well, let me take care of this fellow and send him out there in the bush. He told me this was the best thing that happened to him. Today, his wife is the leader or the head of ADRA uh, in Germany. He's a professor in Germany. He says, I saw God do things there and he told me this one story that moved me. It really moved me. We had a prayer together. He said, when I first got there, uh, I needed to take care of the needs of the people. And he says, there's this man here from Poland uh, that was willing to come out with me and help these people. And so we loaded up two trucks. One truck had all our tents and all the things we needed to be there. And the other truck was filled with the food and the things we we're going to give the people. It says, when we got down in the valley, the truck that had the tent and all the stuff for the camping trip, the clutch packed up. Now, you're in a remote area. You don't have a clutch plate, pressure plate. You have to take the transmission down. And do you have a mechanic? So he says, I waited with this truck here. We had to now wait for a mechanic to come here with parts, fix this truck. So I let the brother from Poland carry on with the supplies, and he went to where they were going. He said, anyway, three days later, he arrives there. It's a Friday afternoon. And this man has given out all the food. That food was to sustain them and the team as well. So he says, Sabbath is about to start and we have no food. He says, we went to bed that night on empty stomachs and we prayed. The next morning they had uh, a service. People came and listened. He discovered one of the other pastors that had come, his wife, had a little container of maheu. Now, maheu is made out of sorghum. So, I mean, if you need it to ferment, you'll have beer. But, of course, they did not have any fermented uh, maheu. This was a healthy drink. And she had some fat cooks, a couple of them. That's all. And so he said, you know what? Brother, I just looked up to heaven and I said, Lord, help us. He prayed over the Baheu and the fat cooks. He said, I started dishing them out and dishing them out and dishing them out. He said, we fed over 300 people. He said, 
that moved me like nothing else, that God is still in the business of doing miracles for his people. He said, everybody, well, he says, I cannot explain it. I said to him, how many baskets were full after that? He said, we had enough. Everybody had enough. So notice what he says about Abram here. It says, by faith he dwelled in the land of promise in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of that same promise. Now notice what it says here of Abram. It says, for he what? He waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is who? God. So Abram did not look down below. Abram's gaze of faith was on God. God wants to do that for you and me, friends. But there's something that we need to do. It's found here in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Now, that's a hard thing for us to do, right? But if we do that and we are true and faithful to God. It says here, if we will in all our ways acknowledge Him, He shall direct your paths. Saul was the first king of Israel. When Samuel anointed him, Samuel thought, wow, this is really a good looking man, but not only is he good looking, but he's of a tall stature. And it looked like he had the way to be able to lead Israel. You know the story with him. The Philistines had gathered together to fight against the children of Israel. The Bible says they had 30,000 chariots. 30,000. That means they had a man in each one of those chariots. They had 6,000 horsemen and a huge complement of foot soldiers. Saul was trembling. Israel was trembling. The Bible says, every man went and hid himself in the dens, in the caves. They were fearful because they had seen this great army. Well, Samuel told Saul, listen, I'm going to come there and we're going to have a special service and ask for God's blessing. And there was going to be a sacrifice that Samuel was going to perform. Well, Saul could not wait. And Samuel gets there, the prophet, and he has been already told by God, Saul has taken it upon himself to do the work of the priest and has offered sacrifice. And so Samuel comes up to Saul and says to Saul, what is going on, Saul? Why is this? So he started okay, but just did not wait upon the Lord. It says here, then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. But when Samuel did not come to Gilgal and the people were scattered from him, this is what Saul decided. He said, bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offerings. Something that a king was never to do. God has always separated the priesthood from the political leadership of a nation. He did it in Israel. It's the same today. There's always been a separation between God's work and the work that political men in office hold. Samuel was beside himself. This is what he said to him, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And why? The Bible tells us, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. From that time onward, God had already decided Saul's time is up. Soon after that, he approached the witch at Endor. The Bible says this year, Saul died for his unfaithfulness which he had committed and also because he consulted a medium for guidance. How is it possible that the leader of God's people who had himself banished all the wizards and witches from the land according to God's command would himself go to a witch in Endor and consult a medium? Sometimes we go looking for God in all the wrong places. 
God just wants us to wait upon him and be obedient to him. This is what the Bible says of Saul, for rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Saul lost the kingdom, he lost his life, and he has lost eternity. Notice what David says here in Psalms 145, verses 15 and 16, one of the last Psalms. The eyes of, of all look expectantly to you, and you give them what? Food in their season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. He says in Psalm 84, verse 11, no good thing will he withhold from those who what? Walk uprightly. So let's wait on the Lord. Let's claim his promises and believe in him. And remember, self-examination. Well, Jesus was on the Mount of Olives and he's talking to the disciples and he says this in Luke 12, verse 36. And you yourselves be like men who what? Wait for their master when he will return from the wedding that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Waiting, waiting. God sometimes just wants us to wait. Why? He wants us to depend upon him, to trust in him, and to know for sure what he has done, he has done. That's why he waited that long for Sarah and Abram, right? That it was an absolute miracle. Hebrews 9.28 says this, Christ was offered once to bear the sins to many, of many rather, to those who eagerly wait for him, he will what? Appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Well, the last one I want to speak about is a man, Saul first from the Old Testament and Saul from the New Testament. Saul is on his way to Damascus. He's got letters of authority from the Sanhedrin to collect and incarcerate anyone of the way. Anyone who is following Jesus Christ, they are going to be taken back to Jerusalem to be tried. Some were imprisoned and some of them were killed. You remember Stephen? Well, Saul had been there when Stephen was martyred. And now he's going to Damascus and he has an encounter with God. And notice what God says to him. Jesus speaks to him and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he answered, who are you, Lord? And the voice answered, I am who? Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And Saul asked the question, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said, arise and go to Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And so Saul had to now be led, blinded. And as he makes his way into Damascus, God gives a dream to Ananias, one of the leaders of the church there, and tells him, go and talk to Saul. And so he goes and he says to him, the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth for you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. Three days Paul is blinded. Three days he's fasting. Three days he's praying. But notice what else he's doing. Acts of the Apostles, page 118, paragraph 3. For three days Saul was without sight and neither did he eat nor drink. Three, these days of soul agony were to him as years. These days of what everyone? Close examination and of heart humiliation were spent in lowly seclusion. Thus he seemed to be shut away from all human sympathy. His only hope of help was in a merciful God and to him he appealed in brokenness of heart. It goes on to say, during the long hours when Saul was such shut in with God alone, Saul yielded himself fully to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. He saw the mistakes of his life. Saul longed to come into full harmony and communion with the Father and the Son. And in intensity of his desire for pardon and acceptance, he offered up fervent supplications to the throne of God. And God came through for Saul. Saul writes in Galatians to you, and he, to you and me today, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This is what Paul says to you and to me today as I'm about to close. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are what? 
in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. And so for me, I have understood that God wants me every day to examine myself. In fact, Jeremiah says this year in Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 16, Stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and what are we to do after that? Walk, walk in it, and then you will find rest for your souls. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage. Pastor Isaac read this for our scripture reading. And he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Why? Because the Bible says the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. I'm going to close on this text. Isaiah chapter 57 and verses 15. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. And he promises us, I love you with an everlasting love. And so whatever you're facing today, as you look ahead in 2024, perhaps it's good to self-examine yourself. Have I been doing God's will in 2023? And I had to give sharp examinations to myself. And I had to be raw and real and honest. There were many times when I was too busy. Too busy that I did not take enough time for communion with God in prayer, study of His Word, and self-examination. I pray that you will take that time. That is what we are counseled to do. And through those hours of self-examination, Pour your heart out to God and say, Lord, be merciful to a sinner such as I. I believe, help thou my unbelief. Those are the kind of prayers that God wants to hear from us. And he will come into our hearts and he will restore us and give us the joy of his salvation. You will find peace and a hope like never before. Remember, we are counseled to do that how often? Every day. Take time. Communion with the Lord in prayer. That's what Jesus did. And from that he came forth what? To minister to the people. And that was the secret of power. And that we can have. It's a promise. He wants us to abide in him and us in him. Let us pray. Father, this morning we thank you. That it is your desire. Not just to dwell among us. But to dwell in our hearts that we might be rooted and grounded in Christ and through the Spirit be strengthened in the inner man of our souls so that we might comprehend with the saints what is the height and the breadth and the length and the depth of the love of Christ. I pray that we might take time every morning to commune with you in prayer and the study of your word and self-examination. And from those moments, O oh God, may we be inspired by your Spirit for ministry. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Where with Jesus I am not
thank you that we can go to the ends of the earth you will be with us there help us to ride on the wings of the wind for they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings of eagles they shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint please help us every day to wait upon you in prayer in study of thy word, self-examination and ministry. Bless us with your presence as we go to our homes and wherever we will spend the rest of the Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen.
on that day we will know you as we lift our voice as one till that day we will praise you for your never ending grace we will keep on singing on that glorious day and we will keep on singing on that glorious day